for the freedom we have to come and worship you and the time that we get to spend together. And I pray you'll help Father as he delivers the message today and that you'll help us to enjoy this opportunity to sing praises to you. And we ask you for rain and thank you for our many blessings in Jesus' name. Amen, John B.C. That is such a blessing. I'll tell you what, John B.C., if you want. Y'all watch her. I do. I knew she went a little bit and I stopped. But she was going <laughs> just like that. And she hadn't taken her eye off of me too much. There. That's right. But she's paying attention. <laughs> Heavenly sunlight. Let's sing all three verses.
Y'all believe that? Say amen. Amen. That's better. I'm telling you what. That is something, it's something to shout about, ain't it, Magnolia? <laughs> yes. And another thing that we can shout about is that Jesus knows our name. Amen. If I can get this story right, there's a little... I think she's now a three or four year old girl that lives in Canadian. And her mom posts stuff on Facebook all the time and she calls them Aubreyisms. And Aubrey loves Jesus and she loves to pray. And she got this thing going for a while where she would pray and then she would say, God said, okay. <laughs> And so one day, she, her mom was praying. And I don't know that she even said what she was praying about. And then after she prayed, Aubrey prayed a little bit, and then she said, Mama, he said, okay. He said, Alex, okay, he knows your name. Out of the mouths of babes. We've done this song before, and so if you want to sing along, you can. If not, just follow the words and really think about that for yourself. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. He knows my Jesus is the answer. So I'm going to ask 
<laughs> your name just went uh, uh, to come and, and read the first part of the scripture. I'm trying not to use my voice too much, and it's a little bit of a lengthy package. It's uh, Romans 7, and she's going to read 7 through 14. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in, in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. And I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, that through the commandment sin might become utterly sinful? For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. Regarding that last statement, one commentator I read used the word seduced, and some translations actually use the word seduced. That's the sermon title today. I thought a couple of times in all of the studies, the laboriousness of Paul's mentioning of the law through these four or five chapters, it just, it almost gets to be around Robin. And I thought, man, we've covered this and covered this and covered this. Maybe I just need to move on to something else. And then God convicted me. He said you were going to preach the word. So preach it all. And so I have abandoned my abandonment and have chosen to um, continue through this book of Romans because, and that was not on, I don't understand. Got pushed up a little bit. And so I've kind of subtitled today's message, The Paradox of the Law. A good expression of what Paul was talking about through these verses 7 through 14. And one of the things that he establishes that, that I really like about the law, he says the law is holy. That word in the Greek means set apart are in, in essence this is divine it's from another place it's from god it's not an earthly thing it's from another place it's holy it's divine because it's from god it's just because it deals with the greek idea of justice which talks about giving god and man their due which he keeps referring to how the law affects us. And as he gets to the end of the passage uh, that we haven't read yet, you'll understand. But the most important thing to remember about the law, yes, it's holy, it's divine, it talks about justice. The most important thing about the law is it's from the voice of God. You remember the original ten, uh, ten Commandments. God wrote them on the stone himself. So, direct from God. Now, there's more spiritual law than just the Ten Commandments. But that's what we tend to think of and refer to. But the next thing that he goes into is he says... 
before the law, I could do whatever I wanted. Didn't know anything about it. this was sin or that was sin. But he said, but when the law came, I was in trouble. Because the law showed me what sin was. It defines sin. Sin had no existence before the law came. Think about it. Uh, in, in this passage, he talks about uh, even a, a child that might not be subject to certain things because they don't know yet that certain things are taboo. Certain things are don't do that. My dad used to talk about a little girl that, that people would ask the, this little, well, she went to school and the teacher asked her her name and she said, Mamie, don't. <laughs> Mamie don't because that seemed to be the thing but this she knew that was the out of that was the boundary Adam and Eve lived in innocence complete innocence they had no idea that they were naked until they broke the one law God gave them their eyes were open then they realized what they had done. The law made the boundary and explained or showed what sin was. You can drive either way on the street. But if they put up a one-way sign, the law has changed. Then you're aware that there's another thing operative here about driving on this particular street or this particular section of this street. Not only does it define sin, now bear with me, because this is going to twist your mind a little bit, maybe. But there is a very real sense in which the law creates sin. Let me explain. Fascination with the forbidden. Just tell somebody not to do something, right? All of a sudden, the mind goes, what happened? Maybe there's some satisfaction to be derived from doing that particular thing. That's one of the delusions. Adam and Eve were tempted by the law. So there's a sense in which the law creates sin. Or at least it opens our minds up to what possibilities may be. And they gain knowledge by breaking it, which I just mentioned. But we are deluded by thinking that there's some satisfaction in something that's forbidden. That's why we call the Adam and Eve apple, orange, whatever you may think it is. We tend to think apple. forbidden fruit. But there's something foreboding about the forbidden and enticing about the forbidden. For, forbidden. And then the other thing about it is well, what's going to happen if I do it? I bet I can get away with it. I know none of you have ever pushed that envelope, all right? And I'm not just for talking in, in regard to God, but with our parents, where, you know, I think I may have, have thought I was some kind of a genius at that. Escaping the consequences. You know what? There's not an escape. Yeah. There's not an escape consequences are always there but there's still that delusion thinking that maybe we just might and then you know if you do something and there's no immediate retribution there's that tempting thought mm, I think I got away with it well maybe for now Paul's convinced here that sin had to be defined because sin is terrible. 
Sin is absolutely atrocious. And the law, by being specific, shows and reveals the terrible nature of sin. It takes the goodness of God's creation and perverts it. It twists a good thing into something bad. For instance, it can turn love into lust. And does. It turns the desire for accomplishment into an obsession for money and power. It turns friendship into seduction for the wrong thing. I love what Thomas Carlyle, the old, 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 he was really more of a philosopher than a theologian, but he had this phrase that I found the quote, and he said all of this regarding the law and sin being revealed by the law, that the revelation is the ultimate or the absolute damnability, I love that word, of sin. It's that important to understand that sin is big. It's huge. And in our world that we live every day, we confess often that, yeah, we sin every day. Sometimes there's a danger in acknowledging that, that maybe we're not Impressing upon ourselves the damnability of what sin is and does. We've seen it in the effects of, of others. And I want to chase a brief rabbit here because we think about <coughs> things we want to do. This, this enticement to be better, to be number one, to be salesman of the year or whatever it could be in, in your world but there's a price for every dream now every dream is not bad it's good to dream and in fact the Bible talks about it often and God gives us Desires, he gives us skills, and we want to be better, maybe a bigger operation or whatever than we are, and we tend to move forward, and that's all good. God placed within us the desire to be better, to move forward, to accomplish more. That's great, that's all good. But the thing that happens with some people as the tail starts wagging the dog and the dream gets bigger than life. And when that happens, a lot of sacrifices get made that shouldn't be made. I'm going to tell you the story. I'm not going to tell you the name, but it's a true story. As I've heard it from his lips. But there's a singer who was a freshman in high school or a freshman in college heard a man singing on the radio and in his mind he said that's what I want to do the rest of my life that's not a bad dream to be an entertainer to be successful to be good at what you do to have the right people around you that make you better. But he decides what he wants and he pursues it with all of his might. Gains local fame, does really well. Decides to take a trip to Nashville. And then the sacrifices start mounting up. He 
works hard in the daytime and sings wherever he can at night. And he accomplishes his dream. He becomes successful. He eventually pray, plays to crowds of hundreds and thousands. Keep in mind, this is true. Gained worldwide fame. It was even said at one point he was the best selling solo artist ever. Not bad for a small town dude. One time, I actually heard him say this. I have more money than my grandchildren's children can spend. Lucky me. <laughs> but one day, the light came. A sudden, all those sacrifices were the big thing unconquered. The things that are really important in life. He retired. Boom. And he said, I didn't do my job. <clears throat> He's referring to the fame. Dreams are awesome. And they're good. But just make sure they come from heaven. And that it's a God thing. I mean, you may not be in a spiritual vocation in terms of making a living. But that's not what's important. What's important is not making a living, but how you live. Pauline, would you come and share the passage that I've asked you to read? Please, ma'am. Praise the Lord, my voice seems to be better today. She's reading verses 21 through uh, 25. Of chapter hmm. 7. Oh, 27, okay. So I find this law at work when I want to do good, evil is right there with me, for in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a, what a rich man I what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. <laughs> Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. A slave to the law of sin. We talked about this passage just a few weeks ago. Paul says, I know what to do, but I don't seem to be able to do it. That's right. Thanks for that amen. Yeah. Said, I'm determined to do better. But that doesn't work out either. You've heard me say before, and it won't be the last time I say it, and the reason we study the Bible is to get better at living it, 
But here's one thing. I have heard people, I've heard this said about people. Man, he knows that Bible. He can quote scripture right and left, and he lives like a devil. Ladies and gentlemen, knowledge without action is merely information. Yep. What Paul is saying here is knowledge is not enough. It doesn't make a person good to know what good is. I know how to play golf. Sort of. <laughs> I know the principles. I can still tell what what uh, tee I'm on. Getting ready for that next hole. <clears throat> but having a lot of knowledge about golf doesn't make you play well. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> knowledge is not enough knowing the definition of morality doesn't make you moral again it's knowledge without action the next thing he says I'm resolved to do better I made up my mind it's going to be different <coughs> And then it's not like I want it. I can't quite get where I want to get. That human resolve to do better is not enough. Having the will to do good doesn't make you do good. Doesn't make it happen. Human will, he's clarifying this, human will, human resolve, human determination Without Jesus, is going to crack. Amen. And then he says, I know what the problem is. I have diagnosed the issue. But diagnosis is not enough. It's one thing to know that you have a disease. But if you don't have the medicine to take care of it, not going to help you. So the diagnosis is not enough. There's got to be some level of follow through. Knowing what was wrong couldn't make him do right. But at the end of the passage, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thank God for Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Of him there's no other. Jesus is the way. What we studied about in Sunday school, Jesus said, I'm the way. So we have this human dilemma. Uh, not, la not laughing enough would be part of it. But the human dilemma of that gap that's between our knowledge, that gap that's between our determination, that gap that knowing what's wrong doesn't get it right. That's why every day we spend more and more time with Jesus. Because the more time we spend with Jesus, the less likely we are to goof up. You can hang out with a golf pro. That's not going to make you a good golfer. But if you hang out with Jesus, all bases are covered. With Jesus, it's a home run every time. Now me, I just might trip getting to first base. Still I'm on the way.
But if the ball's out of the park and I fall on my way to first base, that's okay. I can still get up and run and make the base. And he said, I guarantee Jesus will take care of business. Because it goes back to what I said time and time again. Yes, we are frustrated with our inability to live up to God's standard. But we don't have to think about our inability. We don't have to concentrate on our faults and our failures. We just need to concentrate on Jesus and how he's made us better. Better than we were without him. And so, as a result, pursue your dream with all your might. But just make sure Jesus is driving the truck. Sweet Jesus, we love you today. Thank you, we praise you for the magnificence of your glory. For the delight of your words, but most of all for your sacrifice on Calvary that frees us from the dilemma that we have. The law has revealed to us what sin is. And you have revealed to us that you have conquered it. So we just need to trust you and lean on you, believe in you, trust you in and out every day, day in, day out. And for that, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' mighty name, mighty, mighty name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing a final hymn? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. praise you and worship you and learn about you, Father. We ask that you be with every member of our church that isn't here today. Give them special blessings. We thank you for the health and the well-being of those that are here, Father. And ask that you go with us this week and help us to do your will. And uh, just 